welcome back. I'm your host, Michael Stamatinos with the Advancing Healthcare Innovation Show. And if you're new to us, we're super excited to have you here. And we also happen to be extremely passionate around healthcare innovation, adoption, leadership, access to care. And if this is your first time tuning in, let me tell you a little bit about what we do here. So we are a healthcare innovation company. We're focused on bringing stories of innovation within healthcare to life. And our aim is highlighting real people that truly are innovating within our space and give them the platform to share their stories, share wins, share losses. Uh, we've got an incredibly action-packed year for you with just some amazing content and some fantastic interviews that are planned. And if you haven't had the opportunity to connect and look at some of the historical interviews, make sure you hit the subscribe button now. And I'm just delighted to have Lynn Barr, the founder of Caravan Health and the current MedPAC commissioner, She's a passionate advocate for safety net in rural hospitals. Lynn, welcome to the show. Thank you, Michael. Thanks for having me. Yeah, so maybe we just dig in a little bit for those that um, maybe had been living under a rock. Would you mind giving them a little bit of your background, a little bit of your story, how you've kind of grown from the provider side, what got you interested in on the safety net in rural hospital space, and maybe kind of take us into some of the things that you're working on now. Sure. Um, boy, that's a that's a hard question to answer. That's about seventeen <laughs> questions in there all at once. But uh, I'll, uh, I think I think the point is the background and how did I yeah. get here? And um, and so and it's always important. Everybody's journey is always really informs you know why they do the things they do. Um, I actually grew up very poor um, and had a. a a difficult uh, childhood. My mom was, um, uh, she was addicted to opioids, ended up dying of cirrhosis, was on Medicaid. And the only health care our family got was primarily in safety net hospitals. Um, they were our primary care. They were, you know, obviously, you know, bro broken bones and things went there. Um, and, you know, it just, the, the kindness and the support that my family got from those hospitals, the dignity that they afforded a family like ours um, was truly extraordinary. And one of the things that I've learned, you know, is being out like in the in the wider universe of healthcare is that's a really unique thing that happens in safety net hospitals. It's kind of like how military hospitals can really give something special to to. Uh, to veterans because they speak their language, they understand what they've been through, um, and they don't look down on them. And so I've uh, I've just always had a passion for those hospitals and wanting have been wanting to think of ways that I could help them, and um, and and that's sort of how I started Caravan Health. Was uh, I, um, I? I wanted to. Yeah, you know, I was a, a multiple time innovator. I, this was Caravan Health was my fifth startup. So you know, my previous ones had been in uh, drugs, devices, and information. And I, and when I yeah, you know, I'd taken thirteen products to the FDA and worldwide markets. And at the end of the day. I don't think we know what any of them actually do to patients. And our Hippocratic Oath is first do no harm. Well, we don't even know the harm we're doing um, with all the interventions we do our patients. And I really wanted to see if there was a way to build a better system of care that did more proactive care, more, you know, more holistic care and, um, and didn't just, you know, constantly treat and treat and treat re regardless of the consequences. So on a long story short, I uh, I uh, had uh, after my last startup, I, I really wanted to get at that information that was under underlying all the healthcare system, and so I went uh, and got my uh, master's in public health at the University of California at Berkeley in 2010, and that you know Affordable Care Act was happening. It was like a, a super exciting time to yeah. come into healthcare on the provider side and say, I want to fix this, right? And because when you looked at it, everything was broken, you know, there's nothing but challenges. And and then with the High Tech Act, getting all that money for, for innovation was was super exciting. So I started orga organizing um, and, and as my part of my uh, internship uh, at, at the university, I uh, assisted on the strategic plan for the state of California on health information technology and exchange. And we had 600 different stakeholder groups, you know, so the usual Sutters and Kaisers and everybody yeah. was at the table, right? But there were these 65 rural hospitals and 
they were completely on the fringe of everything. They didn't, you know, they were excluded from all quality reporting and they were hungry. They were hungry for something better for their patients and their community. So I decided to uh, start an organization to support those rural hospitals, which are many of this, there's, there's 2,500 safety net rural hospitals in this country. It's about half the hospitals in the country and, um, and they need our help. So that's how I started Caravan Health was trying to reach out to that special population and see if we could help them achieve better care and lower cost. Pretty amazing. First off, thank you for um, just the vulnerability and sharing your story. Um, I didn't know that from that, and that really just punched me in the face. Um, so to see your reason why it was so clear um, in terms of why you selected those areas. And you mentioned something earlier that really struck me too. I think it's free to give someone dignity. It doesn't cost you anything to treat mm -hmm. someone with respect and dignity. And I wonder, sometimes people forget that. Well, it's funny, you know, it's actually not free. Um, and and uh, this is some of the work, you know, I'm super excited to be a commissioner on MedPAC. I do not speak for the commission. I have to say that every time I speak. Uh, so these are my opinions, but we're working on the safety net right now. And, you know, what, what people don't realize is that when you take a safety net uh, patient, either it's uncompensated care, you don't get paid at all right? Or if they're on Medicaid, most states in Medicaid don't pay the copay. So you you're pay, you get paid 80% of what the fee schedule is. And if you're on Medicaid, you get paid 20% of what the fee schedule is. So there's actually a tremendous cost in taking care of the underserved, which is why they're underserved, right? Mm -hmm. um, you know, in, in our environment today. So I'm excited about all the movement towards health equity and things like that. But until we can start paying providers, you know, the same for treating the poor as they treat everyone else, including Medicare, I think we've got, we've got some work to do. So where do you see, how do you see us closing that gap? Obviously, it's a huge problem. Um, and you've got a little bit more, it seems as though you've got, you've got a lot of connectivity within within healthcare, how have you envisioned, um, if you could kind of paint a magic wand and throw something at this issue, what do you, what do you see happening? Well, you know, from the financial side, I think we're, the commission's actually going to be uh, proposing this week additional payments to make up for that 20% gap. And I think that's important. But, you know, I think we have to think about innovation, right, which is what you're all about. And so yeah. what type of innovation can you apply to these very vulnerable populations, right? And so, and and it's it's funny because most of the innovation we build, we build for the wealthy, right? We build for the people with broadband and iPhones, and you know we've got connected devices, and you know, and even the cost of remote patient monitoring, like what we charge patients for it and what they have to pay for that, you know, it's very very expensive. And so we have to think, and when we think about innovation for the safety net, we're going to have to think very differently. We're going to have to think about people with no resources, no technology. If they have technology, it's going to get stolen, broken, you know. And so it brings it all down to like innovating at a very human level where the only thing that really works at, you know, is frequently that person to person connection. That, that gets into that person's issues and understands, okay, they're not taking their insulin because they don't have electricity and they can't refrigerate the insulin. Right? So you could give them free insulin, but if you can't give them a refrigerator, then you're going to, you're still not going to be able to solve their problem. Right. And so, so how do you do, how do you do that at scale? I mean, is it, I mean, is it just a matter of putting processes together, hiring people, but then all of that somehow has to kind of come together. Can you give a use case, an example of how instances where it has come together, it has worked, and what have you learned? Well, it's funny, you know, it's like, you, I think in healthcare, you hear people talking about stuff a lot, but then there you go, like, I, you've never actually seen it, right? So, yeah, so yeah. what does that really mean? Well, it's all about the workflow. Well, what did you do to change the workflow? Well, I don't know, but they better change their workflow, you know? And so that's kind of how we think about things, right? So we have to look at it, I think, you know, and, and if you want to scale it, right, It's it, it really is about the team. Right. And we've been talking about team based care forever. 
yeah. the same time, you've got, you know, the physician groups don't want the NPs to get paid this and the NPs don't want the nurses doing that. Right. And so everybody's fighting for turf while we're desperately trying to do team-based care. And what I learned is, so you, if you, if you can create teams, you can scale teams, right? Because teams support each other and you have checks and balances. You can't, it can't just be one, one, one-on-one -on -one and it breaks all the time. Right. And what I found is that the, the people that were most amenable to actually working in teams are in the safety net. And they've had this, you know, I, I've got to wear a lot of hats. I got to plug a bunch of dykes, you know, I mean, I'm, you know, they're, they're just very um, entrepreneurial. So for innovators out there, one of the things that, um, you know, I, I've learned in, in my, you know, I, many people have read that famous book, Crossing the Chasm, right? And in my startups is always this idea of how do you identify that initial customer base? that is going to work with you hard enough for you guys to figure out together what this thing really is so yeah. then you can take it to the masses and uh, the uh, the the underserved is an untapped resource for that so you know they're very hungry for grants they're very hungry for financial support but they also just are super they're fantastic team players and they're so passionate about their work that when things fail, they'll figure it out. They won't just go, oh, that vendor, you know, oh, it's that vendor's problem, you know. They, they become very much engaged if if your work speaks to them culturally. So, so it, so it, it sounds like you, you know, if you're in the wild, the best tool you could have is a Swiss army knife. Uh, but when you're not in the wild, people are like, well, what, do you, what do you have to think for? Well, you have a, a a number of folks that are Swiss Army knives and safety net and rural hospitals that are willing to do things that normally wouldn't work in a, in a traditional setting. And you think that that was sort of happenstance, but it's it just sounds like they're they're really aligned with the mission, with the work, with the population that they're serving. They're, they're there for higher level reasons than the paycheck. Um, aside from that, it isn't that easy to get people to move in a certain direction and to get people to utilize things. What, what were some of the things that you use, some of the techniques uh, that you use to get people to really kind of buy into what you're doing aside from forming the team? You know, these are like the foundational principles. Are, are there any tricks of the trade that you're willing to disclose? Um, you know, it's not breaching any of your IP or anything, any, NDAs that you've signed before this or anything like that that you could share with our with our audience. You know, it's funny because it's like I mean, what I feel like what I've done is so rudimentary. You know, <laughs> secret's uh, not you a know. secret. <laughs> <laughs> that, yeah, it's clearly not a secret. I mean, you know, I mean, the, the old adage of quality improvement is you can't um, you can't you can't improve what you can't measure, right? And yet we can't measure quality as an, you know, we can measure outcomes with any sort of statistical validity and say, oh, this provider is a good provider and that provider is a bad provider. I mean, if the outcomes are worse, it's probably because they're serving more patients like my family, right? <laughs> you know, that had no resources, no food, you know, it wasn't because of, of, of you know, other, other, you know, that they were bad people or not doing good things yet. Yeah, but the thing is to improve, you have to measure. And so the, the key for us was whatever, whatever initiative we wanted to do. And we, there were many, many different things that we did to achieve the results that we did. Um, whatever initiative we wanted to do in, in order for us to, to approve it as the executive team, it had to have a complete measurement plan, right? And if you couldn't, and you had to measure things that were were um, were not were were not were not uh, subjective. They had to be objective measurements, and they couldn't be end results. So if I want somebody to 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 uh, uh, call patients every day to remind them to to weigh themselves for CHF, I need to measure how often do they open the software that told them which patients to call. Right. And I need to be tracking that across my enterprise and I need to be looking at outliers and really think about this, you know, from a system point of view, uh, because 
the the everybody wants to do the right thing. Every everybody tries, but everybody gets distracted. People leave. You know, um, management changes. There's constant churn and distraction, and so somebody's got to keep laser focused and say, "Is that nurse still calling those patients every day? You know, or not?" Right. And as yeah. soon as as soon as that behavior stops, you yeah. have to have a system in place that alerts the right people. And then you have a system of meetings and things like that regularly scheduled so that, you know, it's not everything's not an emergency and, and you bring up the data in every meeting and go, um, what happened last week? <laughs> you know, why why didn't you know and and what can we do to help you? Right. What yeah. what management need to know about? that you couldn't get your work done in this week because this is really important work. And I know, you know, when we people think about the kind of work of, you know, prevention, wellness, chronic care management, it's not the super sexy heart transplants, right? But it is what really changes the trajectory of health. And it is incredibly time consuming, somewhat boring, but very important. It sounds like though that there's a cadence of accountability and that's sort of the key, the key sleep well at night discipline combined with the sleep well at night metrics that you're maniacal about. Like, hey, how many times did that clinician actually go into the software right. to act on it? Right. How you're kind of going, yeah. Available? So it's like you're looking at the lead measures, which are then creating the lag outcomes, and you're trying to find the common denominator lead measures. Is that, right. is it hard to find when there's so many things to measure? How do you decide what to You'd be surprised how many things you can measure well and statistically. Very few. Um, hmm. You know, when, and it's, we, uh, we created a, a program. Very where few? Very few. Very few things that you can measure with any statistical accuracy at a, at a small practice or provider level. Almost nothing. <laughs> and they're process measures. That's all you can measure, right? And so either the patients got their annual wellness visit or not, right? You know, did 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 they get the depression screening or not? You know, so you can look in claims data and you can find find things that you know are really important and then you can mm -hmm. monitor those. And then like like I say, you'll monitor, you know, monitoring their performance in the software. And then also then monitoring your own employees and saying, okay. You know, all of Jane's clients are using the software all the time. And wow, Mary's clients aren't ever using this, you know. So what's going on with Mary? You know, but it, you're you're right about like multi, you know, once you have the data, you can hold yourself accountable at multiple levels, but you can also hold the client accountable at multiple levels. So you have that one-on-one -on -one meeting with Mary, and then you know, the next month you're meeting with her boss, you know, and then you know, in the next month the board sees the data. You know, so everybody's getting to see the same data in the right cadence where the person who's most able to change it gets to see it first. Interesting. So we're, we're moving, you know, at the time of this conversation, we're moving into, uh, into a new year. What, what are you most excited about for safety net and rural hospitals going into this year? Where do you see the most opportunity? Ah, God, they're, they're suffering so much right now. I mean, you think your, their patients are suffering. They are, you know, there, there is definitely a world of haves and haves nots and their, their, their margins are declining. Um, so it's going to be a hard year, um, you know, and, and it, like I say, some of the studies we've done in MedPAC, um, you know, what, one of the problems was we didn't really have a good way to measure safety net hospitals. I know that seems obvious, right? But the DISH formula didn't work. And so everybody was DISH, you know, and I'm like, okay, well, that's not right. And so we found a better way to measure them and then found out just how badly they're doing. So, you know, we're, we're proposing that Congress provides additional money to these hospitals. I would, for the first time, I, I believe it's the first time MedPAC's actually proposed that anyone provides additional money to any of the, of the providers, you know, because our, our job is usually to protect, you know, is to protect the trust fund, but also to protect access, right? And mm. to, you know, and to make sure that everybody's still there because a lot of these institutions are are the only place that the poor can get care. Um, so, yeah, yeah, I mean, they are the, the last step. I mean, what happens if that goes by the wayside? Where People do just go? don't get care. Yeah, there's no place to go. 
you can go to an emergency room and get emergency treatment. But if you have cancer, too bad. You know, I mean, it's, you, you know, there's, there is no, there is no last resort. You are the last resort. Um, so, yeah, I think it's going to be very hard, um, you know, for, for everyone. And, you know, we're still re reeling from COVID. I'm very worried about what's happening in China um, as that country goes through COVID now all at once. And, you know, the death, you know, so, so will supply chain issues get even worse? Um, you know, we're having yet, you know, more variants and more variants and everybody I know has COVID right now again. So, you know, there's, I, I, I just, I'm grateful that we have the hospitals we have in this country that have really protected us, particularly during COVID and took on the brunt of everything that's happened. Um, but I'm not sure it's going to be a good year for them. I hope Congress acts. So who in the space that's innovating is is really impressing you right now? You know, God, I hate to give a shameless plug to CBS. <laughs> right? and, then, and I will fully disclose that Caravan Health was purchased by Signify Health, which is then purchased by CBS. And this has all happened in the last 12 months. But um, I'm, and today, uh, CBS and now uh, there was an announcement that CBS was looking at Oak Street. They've looked at Cano. So, so the idea that you know they they have an incredible footprint, right? And um, and almost everybody, you know, half half, half the patients, you know, end up in their door. So right. for them to join the healthcare team and start putting support into the healthcare team. We don't have enough primary care providers. I mean, it is ridiculously hard to get a, a, a primary care provider. So if they can take off the burden of urgent care, you know, things that, that we don't need to waste primary care providers time for and adds, add workforce to this um, in the community, I think they could be a tremendous partner. So I'm really curious, you know, I have no insider knowledge. Uh, I, read, I read what everybody else does in the papers, and that's all I know. Um, but I'm very curious about their strategy and how they will will you know, I hope pay attention to the most important thing around innovation, which is culture, right? And find a way to really mesh with the cultures of the local health systems so that our patients have more access to care, you know, and then hopefully they get all involved in all the value-based payment programs and provide a lot of support for that because we have huge workforce issues. We don't have enough people to do all the work that needs to be done to improve the health of the country. But it sounds like there's the people that are working in a safety net in a rural hospital, salt of the earth people. Uh, so perhaps I'm hypothesizing here, but it, does it tend to be a, a better work culture? Does it tend to be a better environment for people to to work in? Yes, stressful, but perhaps it's more of a better culture. Does do you see that that as an attraction point for people that want to make greater levels of impact, or do you still see it as sort of a it's a big gap, you know, for people to want to work in those types of environments, just knowing the types of stresses that come with it, and so on and so forth. Yeah, you know, I mean, it is a wonderful culture to work in. And they are, you know, it's it, particularly in rural America where everybody that, that is at the hospital or the, the patients, the doctors, everyone, they all live in the same town. <laughs> they all know everybody. Yeah. You know? I mean, yeah. there's, you know, there's, there's no, uh, um, there's no hiding, you know, so, so it's very, it, it, it is a great culture. And you know, what's been difficult, I think, has been whether or not people could, um, um, uh, you know, whether their spouses could get a job, right, in a rural community. And what are the schools like? I mean, that those were the biggest concerns. Now that we got work from home, you know, I, you know, I would love to, you know, just see more and more jobs go, you know, as they have, like, I live in a rural community and our population doubled and these people aren't leaving, you know, and they're still here, you know, so, so, you know, I think there's actually a lot more hope for rural than, than before. And um, that, that, it, because in, you can, you can work anywhere now. And uh, yeah. so maybe that will really change um, the quality of, of, of people we can get to work at those healthcare facilities. And look, we're in a time where there's more digital startups that are coming in day in and day out. If 
there are ones that are looking at breaking into this particular segment. Do you do you have any words of wisdom? Any anything that you think you could share with those types of folks? Boy, that's a, that's been a hard one. You know, we looked at it very hard and did a lot of work. Um, you know, trying to implement those types of tools. You know, everybody wants to say we don't need to change. We just need a, a you know a gadget that's going to fix it, right? But they don't really mean that. They just mean we don't want to change. We don't really <laughs> want the gadget. <laughs> we just we just want to point at somebody else. Yeah. So so. I don't know, you know, um, you know, it's the, the, there's very little margin in healthcare, right? And so where do you get big bang for your buck? You know, you get big bang for your buck in risk coding, right? You know, for Medicare Advantage, you know, they, they can make a lot of money on that. And that's, you know, obviously an area of great concern to all of us. But other than that, the, you know, the interventions, like if you're doing, you know, managing patients with diabetes or hypertension, you're going to realize these gains, you know, I mean, who knows who gets the gains, right? So the financial piece of this is really a mess. Um, and, you know, what, how, how are these companies going to succeed, you know, if, if the financials are so, so messy and, and what it, I think Farzad, um, uh, 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 from uh, Alidade Mustachari, he he had he had a a great quote was which was he was calls them PM PM piranhas, right? Because they're like you know they're eating all the profit, right? Um, you know, and and there's this gadget for this and this device for that. So you know the economic you know the economics of most of these things really don't work out very well, mm -hmm. and I would pay a lot of attention to that. Um, when we initially started our first the first national rural ACO, um, I got together a bunch of stakeholders, and we had a list of sixty different interventions. You know, d remote patient monitoring. You know, mm -hmm. all kinds of sexy things we could be doing. And I did an ROI on every one of them. And we ended up with like three things. <laughs> I can't tell you what Which... they are. <laughs> <laughs> we tell you, but we'd have to. Yeah. <laughs> it's yeah. Cost yeah. You. But it was, it, but it were, it were things that were built into the fee schedule. Right. So like an annual wellness visit that you could, you know, you could get paid really well for. So now I've got a, 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 a mechanism I can use. Now I can, glom on technology and everything onto that because there's $150 for this wellness right. visit. Right. And so if I take 10 bucks off of that, then that's okay. You know, I mean, so it's really understanding the economics. Um, and of course the economics are different in every different sector. So rural gets paid different from FQHCs, gets paid different from hospitals, get paid different from doctors, all for the same exact thing. Right. <laughs> you know, so so also knowing sort of that and, you know, where where you can align in payment as well. And then the culture. Interesting. So you're kind of in an interesting chapter in your life. I'm curious, where do you see, you know, your gifts and abilities, your experience? Where do you see that being used in the coming months, coming years? Because you still have a lot left in the tank. <laughs> I'm old. I'm tired. <laughs> I want to go to the beach. No, I'm, I started a foundation um, and I'm really excited. Actually, we just inked this uh, over the uh, of, over the holidays, um, but I'm I'm uh, I'm funding 100 MPH scholarships for online scholarships for rural providers at the University of California, Berkeley. Um, and I'm excited about that because a education is key you know this you know we can put a hundred people out there in the communities that really understand population health understand vaccines helps to bring down the misinformation gap and helps to start working with the community on moving towards better health and so um and that and we'll be um some of those are going to be uh rural health policy fellowships and i'll i'll be personally mentoring a team each year and taking them to Washington and introducing them to some of the folks I know and and uh, helping them, you know, understand just how you make change, you know, because yeah. anybody can make change. You just have to be really persistent. 
Yes, yes. And I'm just so appreciative that uh, you're using your gift skills and abilities to kind of compound what you've done to create legacy, to, to give back. That's pretty awesome. How can folks follow your work? Are there any other kind of public forums where you're posting yeah. some of these things? How do they follow what you're doing? I've got a, I'm going to set up a, f a website for a foundation this quarter. Okay. So, um, right. so that and it's on my to-do list. <laughs> so and we'll be sure to put that link in the description so people follow you. But in the meantime, um, are you, I know you're on LinkedIn. Can we point people towards that? Sure. Yeah. If you can find me on LinkedIn, I even, I, I will respond. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you, Lynn, for just sharing a bit of your story, a bit of, you know, where you see things headed and how change can happen, how it can happen at scale. The secret's not a secret. You're right. It's not a secret. It's persistence. It's grit. It's it's having a pretty strong, compelling reason why. So for those that have that have joined in, if you found this content helpful for you, would you, would, would you mind sharing it on your social media or sharing with friends, wherever with your network. I'm just grateful when we get folks that are coming in that are just passionate about making a difference, that have a strong reason why they want to move healthcare forward. And I'm even more grateful when these are innovators that are taking action, taking focused action to help advance society at large, to increase access and doing it with a leadership focus. So thank you so much, Lynn. Appreciate it and looking forward to our next conversation. All right. Good luck. Take care. All the Thanks. Best. Bye. All right. Bye.